أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أحمده وأستعينه وأستهديه وأستنصره ثم أصلي وأسلم على خاتم أنبيائه وأفضل سفرائه محمد وآله الطاهرين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين المهدي المنتظر فداه أرواح العالمين I just forgot to mention one thing yesterday in terms of the acts of wudu. It is recommended, it is the most popular opinion that you need to wipe your feet with at least three fingers. But it is recommended to wipe with the entire hand. And I also forgot to mention two preconditions. Number one, tartib. You need to observe the order of operations, so to speak. So you need to do it in order. You wash your face first, then right hand, left hand. You wipe your head with your right hand. Then you wipe your right foot and your left foot. That is number one. Number two, there has to be something called in Arabic mualat. In other words, you need to do it one after the other. You need to do the acts one after the other. So you can't wash your right hand, then rest for 20 minutes, then wash the left hand. You need to do it one after the other. Now, I'll mention a few notes, and inshallah, I'll get to my topic. If you are certain that you did your wudu, but you are uncertain whether or not you invalidated that wudu. So you're certain that you did your wudu, you're unsure whether or not you went to the bathroom after you did your wudu. Here, you act upon your previous knowledge and your previous certainty. So you're certain that you did your wudu, then you're unsure whether or not you invalidated that wudu, then you can pray with that same wudu. And vice versa as well. So if you're certain that you went to the bathroom, but you're not certain whether or not you had your wudu after you went to the bathroom, then you act based upon your certainty, which is you went to the bathroom. You do not have purifications. You need wudu. And if you are sure about both things, so you're sure that you did wudu, and you're sure that you invalidated, well, you didn't invalidate, but you went to the bathroom, but you're not sure which one came after the other. So you went to the bathroom, and you also did wudu, but you're not sure which one came after the other, then here you have to do the wudu one more time. You have to do the wudu again. And finally, if you have doubts regarding your wudu after you finished your prayer, so you finish your, for example, asr prayer, then you have doubts whether or not your wudu was valid, then you don't, need to do, you, need, you don't need to redo the prayer, but you need to do the wudu again for the next prayer. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Traditionally, between the Arabs, the seventh night is the night that they speak about Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Generally speaking, people's last words are summaries of their entire beliefs. So their last words on their deathbeds are summaries of what they believe in, what they truly believe in. And there are a few examples. Example number one, my father mentioned this a few nights ago, Harun al-Rashid, the person, the caliph that killed Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam. On his deathbed, he reads this verse from the Quran. مَا أَغْنَى عَنِّي مَالِيَهِ هَلَكَ عَنِّي سُلْطَانِيَهِ What good did my kingdom do? What good did my, my money, my wealth do? And the first caliph, on his deathbed, what does he say? He says, يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَكْبِسْ عَلَى دَارِ فَاطِمَةِ I wish I hadn't pushed the door of Fatima. The third is from Rasulullah. There's an interesting twist here. So there are two accounts of what happened 
on the death of Rasulullah. His wife claims, she says that the Prophet opened his eyes, his head was in my lap. Now you can imagine this, the seal of all the Prophets, the greatest Prophet, Rasulullah Muhammad. His wife claims that he opened his eyes. He said, give me a bowl. What does he want to do with a bowl? She claims that the Prophet said, give me a bowl, I want to urinate. Does it, does it sound realistic? I don't know. The second account is from Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet's successor. He says the Prophet opened his eyes. And he said three words. As-salah, as-salah, as-salah. Which one sounds more realistic? I'm trying to get to a point here. The most important words of a man are the words that he says on his deathbed. There was a scholar here yesterday. He said that there was a person, he wasn't very observant, he wasn't a very religious man. In fact, on the contrary, he was a, an unbeliever, I think. On his deathbed, he says three words. He opens his eyes and he says, Islam, Islam, Islam. So, what does this have to do with Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? What did Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas say in his last moments? And before this, I want to start with a short introduction. You see, brothers and sisters, you don't plan to be great. You do what is asked of you to do. You do what your responsibility is. You do your duty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's His choice to make it great or not so great. It all has to do with how sincere you are. There was a scholar that used to say, it is the duty of every single student in the hawza, in the seminary, to study until he becomes a mushtahid, until he becomes a jurist. Then what does he do? He waits for his responsibility. You all know who Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was. He was a knight in every single aspect of the word. He was the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He knew how to fight. The historic account says that when he got on his horse, he put his foot in the stirrup. The stirrup is the middle, is the metal accessory that attaches to the horse where you put your feet and he pushed it until it snapped leather can you can you snap leather with your own hands this is the sort of person that he was he was a fighter he was a knight but what was his responsibility he waits for his responsibility from his imam the imam says go and bring water for the children this is his responsibility and what did he show? What sort of courage did he show and symbolize when he went to get water for the children? He went and he put the water in the leather bottle and he grabbed it in his hand. The wicked man was waiting for him behind a tree. He was riding his horse. The man grabs a dagger and he chops his right arm. What does he say? What would you say? What would I say? Really, there's nothing else to think about other than my hand. What does he say? He says, Wallahi in qata'tumu yamini inni uhami abadan an dini. I will always protect my religion. Unfortunately, one thing that we're seeing, and it's very common these days, People use their religion as their first shield. The first thing they lose is their religion. And there are a lot of stories. I remember my, uh, my brother, he met this person. He's a Shia, he comes to the centers. He says, my daughter applied for a job at Goldman Sachs. He says, when she applied for the job, they said, you know, your credentials were, look great but you wear a hijab. So she came to her father asking for, 
you know, consulting her father. She wants to see what her father has to say. And what does her father say? He says, you know what, it's, at the end of the day, it's what's in your heart. So she took off her hijab, basically losing the last bit of identity she has for a job. The first thing people lose is their religion. What is our responsibility? Look at the life of Abu al-Abbas. Look at what happened in the last minutes and hours of the life of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. He did not compromise. He did not show weakness. My brother mentioned this a few nights ago as well. You shouldn't care about what racists and bigots say. It's a free country. You want to pray? Go pray. You shouldn't care about what people have to say about it. Someone makes fun of you. A racist person makes fun of you. It shouldn't affect your religion. It's a free country. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Protect yourself and your family from the fires of hell. Then what does Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam say? He says, وَعَنْ إِمَامٍ صَادِقِ الْيَقِينِ First I protect my religion, then I protect my imam. How did he protect his imam? His connection with his imam was far greater than a hand or a second hand. How do we think of our imam? Some of you might be wondering why I emphasize so much on on our connection with Imam Zaman. But it is our duty to ask about the Imam. You see, if you were here, if you were there, excuse me, at the time of Imam al Hussein, you'd be asking about him. You'd want updates about the Imam. What's happening? Where's he going? What is our connection like to our Imam? Do we know him? Our duty is to at least know about the Imam. Do you know what the Imam looks like? If he reappears, would you, would you be able to tell him from another person? What is our duty? There was, there's a story, there's a hadith, I think, that says the Israelites, back in the time of the Pharaoh, before Moses shows up, when they met, when they met between themselves, they would ask about the Messiah, about the Savior. What are we doing about our Imam? Do we even care? Do we read about him? There was a, a scholar, a marja and mashhad. He said to a student of his, he said that in a day there are 1,440 minutes. Try to dedicate at least five minutes of your time for the Imam. And don't think that this is a waste of time. The Imam hears you. In one hadith, someone comes to Imam Amir al muminin the Imam tells him, we get sick when you get sick. We pray for you. So if you have some issues, I was speaking to a friend, to a dear brother today. He had an issue, he said, I couldn't speak to anyone. And I thought to, him, to myself, why didn't he speak to Imam Zaman? Our messages reach him for sure and he can help us. Whenever you're going through issues or problems, speak to your imam and I guarantee you if you're, if you're not going to get a response, at least the problems will go away. <coughs> and I've already taken too long of your time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the, the privilege of servitude to our imam inshallah. وصلى الله على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين